Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask that you have your way supernaturally and bless us by the ministration of your word. Bless your people beyond any shadow of doubt. And let's live here equipped and blessed in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Oh, let's say amen. amen. Can we say amen better? Amen. Can we say it louder? Amen. Okay. So straight to the point, wisdom type one is conscience. Conscience. Now, conscience is moral wisdom. Moral wisdom. Moral wisdom. Moral wisdom. Nations make rules, laws to regulate the behaviors of their citizens. Companies have code of ethics. Professional bodies have code of ethics to regulate the behavior of their members. Companies have, have um, values to also regulate the behaviors of their staff. Um, parents have rules at home to regulate the behaviors of their children. Imagine nations without laws. Imagine this world without laws. There are even international laws that regulate how countries relate with each other. But there's also what we call conscience. Now, conscience is the law that regulates you when no one is watching. It is when you are left alone and nobody is watching, watching how your life is regulated. And I want us to quickly look at supporting scriptures for this type of wisdom. Conscience is moral wisdom. Moral wisdom. Now, 1 Kings chapter 3, the verse 7 to 9. Now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David. But I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen. A great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern these great people of yours? Moral wisdom is the ability to distinguish between right and wrong and the capacity to choose right over wrong. Moral wisdom is the ability to distinguish between right and wrong and the capacity to choose right over wrong. In life, in every situation, you have only two choices. Right and wrong. If you are morally wise, you will always choose right over wrong. Nobody does a wrong thing and justifies that it was a mistake. It can never be a mistake. It, because at every point, you always have an alternative. You will always have an alternative. The word wrong would not have existed if there was no the, of, of an alternative which is called right. So in the inside of you, God has placed something we call conscience. If a woman walk, it walks into your room naked, your conscience will always tell you this is wrong. Don't do it. It is this inside you, inside you, that these laws that God himself has placed in the inside of you, rules that God himself has placed in the inside of you, and any time you are confronted with a situation and you have to make a choice, your conscience will always tell you, this is wrong, this is right. Moral wisdom is the capacity to choose right over wrong. Are we here? Anytime you take an action or you do something, you have a conflict with somebody or you do something, when you are alone, when you are alone, your conscience comes back to start talking to you. Now, anybody who is morally wise, you will always analyze your actions. If the previous actions you took were wrong, you will analyze it 
correct it, and if apology can solve it, you apologize and move on. But hey, it's not everybody that chooses right over wrong. Why? And it's not, all of us, our level of choosing right over, even if we are choosing right, sometimes the kind of right you, you choose, we all have different levels of moral wisdom. And I'm going to share with you right now the six types of conscience and how it affects our choices between right and wrong. Between right and wrong. And why some people are unable to see when they are choosing right over wrong. No matter what you tell them, how some people have no, I will, I will show you why some people have no remorse or repentance. Everything you do, everything you do in life, there will be that still small voice that will be speaking to you. It is right or it is wrong. So there are six types of conscience. Number one, pure, pure conscience. Pure, uh, pure conscience. Pure conscience. First Timothy 3 verse 9. Holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. You see, when you study God's word, and you build a strong relationship with God. You begin to walk in certain levels of purity. That enables you to choose right over wrong. Based on your relationship with God. And your strong biblical principles. Are you here with me? And your strong biblical principles. When you build strong relationship with God, it brings you to the level of purity. In this case, we call it pure conscience. Where you make choices. You choose right over wrong based on your biblical principles. It doesn't matter the consequences. You will choose right over wrong. That's why I always say that when people have excuses for sinning, doing the wrong thing, and we change the title of sin and we call it a mistake, it tells you where your conscience level is. And I come and share other ones with you. Where your conscience level is. There are certain levels of sinful life you will never get there if you have a pure conscience. The second type of conscience is good conscience. Acts 23 verse 1. And Paul, earnestly beholding the counsel, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. Good conscience. Now, what's pure conscience? Conscience is based on your relationship with the word of God and your relationship with God. Good conscience is basically um, influenced by your good, good upbringing. Your good upbringing. Your parents build you, raise you well, set examples for you. So you become good. And so your good upbringing. I, I met a guy who said, I've had problems with my wife, but I saw the way my father married my mother and my father never cheated on my mother. And that's why I'm still in this marriage. And my father... If my, my father didn't divorce my mother, so I can't also divorce my wife. You see, this is, the person is not talking from biblical. He's not quoting Bible. But he has seen good examples. And those good examples has built, has built a certain kind of conscience in his mind. Any child who sees his father beating the wife, any boy who sees the father beating the wife, there are 90% chance that you will beat your wife. But are you here? You are either going to say, I saw the tears of my mother and I'll never let this happen to any woman. Or you, you, or you just make a choice that this is normal. Men beat women. Because you saw it happening. There are 90% chance that a guy who sees his father drinking or smoking is likely to do the same. There are also 90% chance that the guy who saw his father not drinking, not smoking, 
will also not do it. That's why there are some people there, eh, they don't go to church. But they are morally upright. They are more morally upright than people who go to church. That's why you find some people who say that I mean, I'll never go to church. Because I, even though I don't go to church, I'm better than people who go to church. So some training can make you good. But a, a, the good work of a man is like filter rust before God. It is all right to be good, but that is not what will take you to heaven. What will take you to heaven is not goodness. It's a righteousness. And righteousness is having a right standing with God. If we do a good thing in Christ, it is called righteousness. If we do it outside Christ, it is called goodness. And that does not take you to heaven. Are you here with me? Do you understand what I'm teaching? Good. Now the third type of conscience is what we call evil conscience. Evil conscience. Hebrews 10, 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Evil conscience. These are people who can, who can do arm robbery without fearing. Because their conscience is so evil. These are when you have an evil conscience, eh? you can sleep with your best friend's wife and you won't feel guilty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you have evil conscience, when people are doing you good, the same people doing you good, you can do them bad without feeling it. When you have evil conscience, you can steal from church offering without feeling guilty. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm telling you. When our church was very small, one man came to give a complaint. They were the wooden structure. The man was part of people who used to count the money. And that day, he gave $100. $100 as an offering. When he got to the offering room to count the money, he was part of people counting the money. He said, where is my $100? My, my $100 I gave. They couldn't find it. In between the transition, somebody has taken it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Evil conscience. Recently, they caught a guy who went into a Roman Catholic church, created a hole in the building, and went in to steal the small money the church has in the village. And when he was coming out, he got stuck. It is evil conscience to do that. People who do arm robbery, do 419, do all those things, they fall into evil conscience. And they don't see anything wrong with it. I've seen people who justify 419 by saying that the white people cheated us, so we are also cheating them. <laughs> that they enslave us. Go and, go and go and enslave some of them. Go and cast some of them. What I want you to do is not to take their money. Go and cast some of them. Put them in a um, ship. Tie them up in chains. Bring them to Africa. And then come and weed for us. And clean the gutters. You see, you see people doing evil to their fellow human beings and they justify it. You see a woman who has cheated on the husband and it's not, it does not regret to but I say, because you don't give me attention. Evil conscience. A man who has cheated on the wife. A woman beat the wife when the wife complains. Doesn't feel guilty. Evil conscience. This is, when you get here, you become so evil in your heart. And you don't have regrets for it. Are you here with me? The fourth type of conscience is defiled conscience. Titus 1. 15. Unto the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. Now this is the corruption of your, of your conscience. Corruption of your morality. You can be among a group of people who will corrupt your morality. When I was in secondary school, I went to secondary school late. So 20, 20 something years, I think at 20, 18, 19 years, I was still in secondary school. And my, my, my friends saw that I was a virgin. I mean, I started 20 years in second because I went to middle school. Then they came to me. Is it fair? Is it true? Are you a virgin? I said, yes. So you haven't tasted it before? Oh, Titi, you are losing. No. Charlie, you shock us. So, you see, these were evil people who wanted to corrupt my conscience. One sister, one sister told me, that all the sisters around her, though they come to the same church, all the sisters are boyfriends and girlfriends. They are in the same department. They are boyfriends. Some of you have two. 
Some have sugar daddy, milk daddy, uh, wache daddy, awuza koko daddy. They have different. And she feels so. One time I was just talking to that sister. Sister said, sometimes I feel I'm not normal. I said, why? He said, because everybody is doing it. All the people that you, all the people you trust, all the people you talk to, you smile, all the people, some of them that you mentioned their name in their pocket, I know, I know what they do. So sometimes I ask myself, am I taking this Christianity thing too far? You see? I said, no, sister, don't let your conscience be defiled. Don't let them corrupt your conscience. Keep that pure conscience. You are the normal Christian. They are abnormal Christians. Now, now, you see, that's the problem now. The problem we have now is that abnormality is becoming normal. And normality is becoming abnormality. Today, if we're a virgin, you don't make the front page of a news listing. But if you are nude, tattooed body, nude, and other things, that's where you will make it. When you watch Golden Globe and um, all these awards, this thing, the one who comes almost naked is the one that they would describe as the sexy woman of the night. Those who come well dressed, the cameras don't even want you. Uh, pass. Let's take. Let's take the. Let's take the. <laughs> the this thing. Now women have some pressure they take. Eh? You have to wear clothes, and then you you open here, and then you bring your leg out, and then they tell you show some flesh, show some flesh. So you have women who are sixty years showing wrinkled flesh. <laughs> wrinkled. They, they <laughs> and then I said, Ah, why are you worrying yourself like this? But that's how you have become. But keep a pure conscience. That is, that's what wise, wise people do. That is why, that's where you get your breakthrough. That's where you are honored. That's where God will eventually bless you. Keep it. And then we have people who are weak conscience. Weak conscience. 1 Corinthians 8, 12. But when ye sin, so against the brethren, and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. You see, a person with a weak conscience is a person who cannot take a position on mor morality. But I want to listen to all the sides before I decide. Is, is homosexuality good or bad? Let me listen to the sides. I want to listen to the arguments. You, you, are, you have no mind of your own when it comes to standing up for morality. You have no mind of your own. You cannot decide that this is the right thing I want to do and I want to do it, I'm convinced it's the right thing. Other people have to convince you. You have to get other people's opinions. But you see, the most important opinion is the word of God. Whatever is wrong is in the Bible. Whatever is good is in the Bible. Today, in the Bible school, I was teaching the pastors. One of the pastors asked me, is it good for a pastor to drink? I said, you won't find it in the Bible that do not drink. But why you, by what you will not find in the Bible, you do not find, you can never find in the Bible the advantages of drinking. The only thing you find in the Bible are the disadvantages of drinking. If any of you can show me one advantage of drinking in the Bible, apart from what Paul said to Timothy, for your stomach's sake, I say, you don't have a drink. It's an advantage. You are sick. Go and take medicine. Paul said, take medicine. Use it as medicine. You, what kind of sickness do you have? And even Paul said, take a little alcohol. You, one bottle, one and a half, two bottles, three bottles. You drink 12 bottles of beer. He said, Paul said, um, You do that thing you are doing like this. They still say that, well, the Bible said that we should drink, but we shouldn't get intoxicated. So uh, that's why I drank. I'm not intoxicated. I heard a, I heard, um, a comedian say that um, a man got so drunk, he went to take a prostitute and drove the prostitute to his house, thinking it was a hotel. And when the wife came and said, uh, receptionist, do you have room here? <laughs> there are some people eh, I have stopped admonish, admonishing them. I have stopped giving them advice. There are some people. You know why? This one, seared conscience. You waste your time on them. 
1 Timothy 4, 2. Speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. These people, they feel no guilty. They have no remorse. They can do evil. When you preach, they laugh at you. When you talk about holiness, they laugh at you. They, 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 you, you get it. It's the highest form of foolishness. So those people, eh, those people, I don't waste my time on them. But when I come to church to preach, I preach to only 25% of the congregation. How many of you are in the 25%? Yeah, hey, powerful, powerful. Powerful. Because Jesus said a farmer went out to cast his seed. Some fell on the tongue, some fell on the, by the road, some fell um, in the rocky places, some fell on good soil. So he fell on four places, 25, 75% of the seed didn't material, didn't bear fruit. Only 25% did. In the, in, the, in the congregation, only 25% appreciate the sermon, obey the sermon, and live by the sermon. When I was a young pastor, I used to cry when I hear a church member has committed adultery, a young girl in the church is sleeping with men. I can go and say, Father, am I not doing my work well? Why am I preaching and these people are still sinning? Now cry. One day the Lord said, remember the, the parable of the sower. It's only 25% of the people you preach to who will listen to you. Remember my son said the road is narrow and only few people travel on the narrow road. Only few people travel on the narrow road. So I said, he said, I'll bring you thousands, but focus on the hundreds. Focus on all the thousands. You will never be able to become a great pastor. Are you here? So there are some cases I've left it to God. I said, Father, this brother's case is in your hands. This sister's case is in your hands. The rest I can handle. I said, Jesus, you are the chief shepherd. I am an under shepherd. <laughs> pastor this group. Let me pastor the rest. You died for them. Are you here with me? Do you appreciate that? Yeah. I honestly don't know which of the, of the group you belong to. Those that cannot pastor or those that can pastor. The 25%. Uh, which, where are you? Are you on the 25%? Raise your hands and say, yeah, 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 yeah. Good. Now, number two is maturity. Maturity is behavioral wisdom. So the first one was conscience, which is moral wisdom. The second is maturity, which is behavioral wisdom. Behavioral wisdom. Behavioral wisdom. First Samuel 18, verse 30. Then the princes of the Philistines went forth, and it came to pass after they went forth that David behaved himself more wisely than all the servants of Saul, so that his name was much set by. One of the wisdom David had under, under, under Saul was behavioral wisdom. Because the way Saul tortured David's life, the way Saul tortured David's life, and David had the opportunity to kill Saul, and he still did not kill him, was because the guy was wise. I mean, the man on several occasions had threw javelin at you, and you have dodged the javelin, and you still go and play the thing for him. Because David knew that one day I will sit on this throne, but there are methods, procedures, and process in getting there, and I'm going to follow it. David could only survive under a king he was working for who wanted to kill him because of behavioral wisdom. Are you here? The way you behave, behavioral wisdom. Now I'm going to show you. Please, let's go to the next slide. There are three types of maturity that determine our behaviors. Three types of maturity. Number one. Number one. Okay, so here, here they are. Number one. Maturity by nature. Maturity by nature. Maturity by nature. First Corinthians 13 verse 11. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I talked like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways, I put the ways of childhood behind me. So, so whilst you are growing, you are supposed to behave better than you were before. But hear this. Hear this. Wise people grow up. The rest grow big. Are you here? Wise people grow up. The rest grow big. So, so the fact that you are growing big does not mean you are growing up. I always say I'm married at 20, 24. And at 24, I was like a 30 year old man. I had matured. Some people can be 30 and they behave like 20 year old people. Some people can be 20 and behave like 10 year old boys when i was a child i talked like a child i talked like a child i reasoned like a child when i became a man 
I put the ways of childhood behind me. So God himself has arranged it in a way that as you are growing up, you think better. You become wiser. And it is seen in your behavior. Maturity is seen in your behavior. The way you organize yourself, organize your life, organize your home, organize your room, organize your dressing, the way you talk, your composure. Your, I mean, people know that, oh, this guy is very matured. But there are some people, they have grown big, but they have not grown up. It's your choice. Analyze your life. See whether you have grown up or you have grown big. Number two, maturity by nurturing. Maturity by nurturing. Proverbs 22 verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he will not depart from it. When I see your behavior today, I can tell how you were raised. When I see the way you talk to elderly people, and the way you talk to, you, you relate with the opposite sex, etc., etc., then I can tell the way you were trained. And then number three, maturity by experience. Your experience in life will either make you better or bitter. I've said this here over and over. When you learn through experience, it matures, it matures you and you get better. When you go through experience and you blame everybody, you don't get matured. What, they say that experience is the best teacher and I believe that. I believe that the school of hard knocks, the school of hard knocks really helps you. Do you understand what I'm teaching you? When, when um, Frank Lampard was taking the Chelsea job, he was told that it was too early to take a big job like that. He didn't listen. And now where is he? He's gone into oblivion. He should have stayed in the second division. It is um, a championship. Because those who were telling him were men of experience. They were telling him that to be able to coach Chelsea, you should be coaching Porto and Real Madrid all those small teams finish coaching Real Madrid, Barcelona, Liverpool before you come to Chelsea. He didn't listen. Oh, he didn't. Oh, no, 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 no. In this country, before you can even coach Kotoko, you should have coached House of Folk. And. Oh, oh, true, true, true. True. You should have coached House of Folk and things before you can coach Kotoko. So experience is important. So you see, when I come here and I'm speaking, you see that, okay, this pastor is experienced. This pastor is experienced. I've been pastoring for 30 years. And I know how to pastor. My, my, my experience has taught me more than my education in the Bible school. That's why I don't joke with men that have experience. That's why I listen to men who are more, who are more experienced than me. Are you here? Number three, talent number three, um, wisdom number three, wisdom type three is talent. Talent is innate wisdom, innate wisdom, innate wisdom. Exodus 35, the verse 30 to 35. And Moses said unto the children of Israel, See, the Lord hath called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur. Of the tribe of Judah, listen, and he has filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, and in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship, and to devise curious works, to work in gold, and to work in silver, and to work in brass, and in the cutting of stones, and to set them and in the carving of wood, and to make any manner of cunning work. He had put in his heart that he may teach both he and I. Aholiab, the son of Ahi Shamash, of the tribe of Dan, them that he filled with wisdom of heart to work all manner of work of the engraver and of the cunning workman and of the embroiderer in blue and in purple, in scarlet and in fine linen, and of the weaver and even of them that do any work and, do, and that and of those that devise cunning work. So let me help you understand. I was talking about Bezalel. And God just said that the ability the man had, has to be able to do handwork and design things in gold, do engraving and all those things. God said it's a type of wisdom. So every human being has an ability. It's an ability to produce wealth in Deuteronomy 8.18. That is your wisdom. It is the wisdom of Ronaldo to play football. 
It is a wisdom of mercy to play football. And they made millions. The wisdom, it, the wisdom of um, the Brazilian boy, Neyman, to play football. You see, these guys, the way they play football, if they were playing in Africa, would have said they'd gone for Juju. Whoa, yeah, yeah. Would have said, oh, this guy is Juju. Because sometimes, see, when things beat our imagination, when things beat, beat our imagination, we ascribe them to the devil. Oh, this is Juju. It's not real. This thing is not real. I, I watched a football match where um, um, Messi dribbled Jerome Boateng or Bayern Munich and the guy fell down. The way he dribbled and fell down. The commentator said, come on, this is criminal. Come on. <laughs> you understand? In Africa, I would say, no, no, this is Juju. No, this one there, the guy has gone for something. He has gone for Juju. But see, all of us have a certain innate wisdom. We were born with it. Ability to do some things. Some people have the wisdom for accounting. Some have wisdom for medicine. Some have wisdom for sewing. Some have wisdom for singing. Some have wisdom for playing equipment, instruments. Some have wisdom for speaking. Some have wisdom for writing. And all these wisdoms are in the inside of you. You are required to develop them and make them better. Whatever God has put in you is in their raw state. You are supposed to add value to it. Why people discover it and they add value? Ronaldo or Messi may not have moral wisdom, but they will have innate wisdom. Now, innate wisdom is your world's creation ability. It's your world's creation ability. Discover it's in the inside of you. And develop it and build it. It will put money in your pocket and food on your table. The richest places on earth it's not a gold mine in Obuasi. In Ghana, the richest place in Ghana is not a gold mine in Obuasi or the oil field in Tano or somewhere or the diamonds in, um, in Akotia. No, the richest place on earth is that ability in the inside of you. It's lying in the inside of you. If you discover it, you develop it and you use it, you will, you will create wealth for yourself. And live happily ever after. If you want to enjoy life, if you want to be happy in life, one of the things you should do is go in the inside of you and discover. I do three things. I speak, I write, I think for people. I make money doing these three things. Thinking, writing, speaking. If you give me football, I can't play. I tried playing football. It was a terrible thing. Oh, you are a terrible thing. I used to play number two. It's, not, it's called right full back, eh? Or right half back. Right half back, isn't it? I used, to, I used to play that position. Mommy didn't know me by then. They would have given me scholarship. But the football, oh, I used to play football and the referee would say, pray, 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 I won't hear. I'll still be playing. Until, until my friends would hold me and say, yuff, yuff. the referee is whistling. I would chase the boss. Ah, I'll go and hit my my own player. I would tackle my own player in the same team. My focus was always on the ball, not the one having it. If you don't take it, if you are even going to score the opponent and I'm there, I will tackle you. I thought that everybody having the ball must be tackled. I told our, our, our coach in our team in, in, in school that I'm a good footballer. The coach looked at me and added me to the football team. We went for one training. The next day, Packed my things, I brought it to school. We we're going for second training. I was telling my friends, Tell her, I'll see you, I'll see you, I'll see you. When I got the coach, I said, Oh, this is your friend, go back, go back. Go back. What you did yesterday, you can't come again, go back. Now, it was hard to get back to the classroom. That was difficult for me. Hey! I told them that I'm a star, I'm a football star, I'm coming. I said, Oh, I'm coming. My, I was teasing my other mates. Oh, Charlie, I'm a football star. Bye bye, bye bye, bye bye. Then I got there, they said, Go back home. Oh! I've seen my sons making the same mistake. When Kevin was little, he said that he was a footballer. I knew that, Charlie, it's your father's mistake you are making. It's in, the, it's in the blind line for us to assume that we know how to play football. Now, Nana is doing the same thing. My house after Sunday is like Wembley. Nana and his friends play football. I see Nana running. I say, hey, God, God, deliver, <laughs> deliver my son from this blind line problem. Now, footballers are expensive. I want to sell this boy. Apparently, I was not a footballer. I just loved watching football. And I, I, didn't, I couldn't interpret the love well. 
I thought it was a love to play, but it's actually the love to watch. Are you here? So there's something in you. So when I discovered my ability, I stayed with it. And today it has brought me very far. Discover yours, develop it, build it. That's what wise people do. Wise people discover their abilities. They develop it, they build it, and then they sell it. I was telling a friend, I preached in a church, and they gave me an offering. When I sat in the car, and I opened the envelope and saw the check, I felt guilty. Just one night. This plenty money. Just one night. Just one night. I have this plenty of money. That's how you are. When you develop yourself and you build yourself very well, it is people that will determine your value. They will place value on you. I spoke somewhere one night. One night, the offering I was giving. Hey, why? What did I say? What did I do? It's like, like somebody's one year salary. I was sitting down quietly. I was feeling guilty. This thing. I was thinking, should I return it or I should keep it? But my other side says, hey, Charlie, keep it, keep it, keep it. <laughs> okay, number four. Number four. Number four is imitation. Imitation, transferred wisdom. Imitation, transferred wisdom. Can I see the next slide, please? Transferred wisdom. Proverbs 13, verse 20. He who walks with the wise grows wise, but the companion of fools suffers harm. He who walks with the wise, that's what? Grows wise. It's a biblical principle, is there? If you want to be wise, one of the ways to get wise is to identify wise people, associate with them, walk with them, sleep with them, eat with them. When I say sleep with them, that doesn't mean go and lie on them. I mean like um, where they live, live there. Dine with them. You eventually become like them. And the Bible even says that observe the ants, you struggle. Consider ways and be eyes and be wise. You can even observe ants and become wise. How much more a wise person? Don't be around me for my wealth. Be around me for my wisdom. Because that will take you further than how much money I will give you. Are you here with me? You understand what I'm teaching you? Okay? So associate with wise people. I've said it here in one of my books that it is better to be last running with horses or running with horses than to be first running with tortoises. I would prefer to run with horses and be last than to run with tortoises and be first. Last time, I think somebody said this here, and I've also repeated it before, that if all, you are better than all your friends, then you, are, you don't have confidence in yourself. You must surround yourself with people who are better than you. And don't be envious of people who are better than you. Don't be critical of people who are better than you. Be there, learn, learn from them, learn their success secrets and stories, and build yourself from there, and you will become. It's in the Bible, he that was with the wise grows wise. It's as simple as that. And the Bible is true. You can't change it. What the Bible says is what the Bible has said. And if you follow it, you shall become. I work with wise people. And all my friends are older than me, wiser than me, more successful than me. And I work with them, I observe them, and I observe the way they do their things. And I build from there. When I was on the National Peace Council, I was the youngest member of the National Peace Council. I don't go to meeting to go and show myself as a millennial. At least between them and me, I'm a millennial. Between me and Kevin, Kevin is millennial, I'm an old school. But between them and me, because I just, I mean, one of them was an attorney general in 1969. I was one year. Can you budget? An attorney general in 1969. I was one year, and I was sitting on the table with a person. Why, why, why must I go and talk and show that I know? Then the person came to one of my events. I was doing, doing those days, I used to have events. I filled the whole of the National Theater. And people be standing outside. The guy came to that event and saw it and turned to my wife. He said, ah, your husband is a big man like this and when he comes to meet him, he doesn't talk. I said, the, the history, the secret of the bigness you are seeing today is my ability to keep quiet and listen to what you people are saying. <laughs> you understand? And listen to what you people are saying. You learn more listening. Jesus at the age of 12 at the age of 12, the Bible says that his parents found him in the temple. Now, his, the, other, the parents thought he was missing. Because a boy of 12 should be playing football on the beach or playing chaskele with his friends in the corner. They were in a village. So they, they should be looking for him catching snails or something. Or 
catapulting, using catapult to kill birds. So they went to look for him. They never thought he was being in the temple. So he wasn't missing. They were looking for him in wrong places. When they found him in the temple, the Bible says that he was listening and asking questions. He was not talking. He was listening and asking questions. Some of them, I see a lot of young people and the way they talk, the way they talk, I, I pity them. They haven't reached out. I mean, people come to me, people come to me to have a conversation and they talk more than me. And I look at them, I listen to them. Then when they finish, your time is up. There are people waiting for me. Have you finished talking? Let me pray for you. When you come to me and you talk and I don't talk, and I say, let me pray for you. Please don't be happy. It means you are overtalked. You have, you, have, you have come for me for counseling, but you have answers to all your problems. All the problems you are telling me, you have answers. You say one, you draw conclusion. You say the other one, you draw conclusion. And then you say, so you have come to inform me about the conclusion you have already drawn. You, are, you don't need my opinion. So when you finish, I say, okay, now let me pray for you. I say, Father, have mercy. And let your hand be upon this person. Father, I beg you, order the steps. For if you hear me say, Father, I beg you, it means I am having mercy on your soul. <laughs> you know me, I don't hide my things. So one day when you come and you are kneeling down, I say, Father, I beg you, have mercy on this soul. That means that your case is a miserable one. Amen. Okay. Now, the fifth type of wisdom is called cognitive wisdom. Cognitive wisdom. Information. Cognitive wisdom. How knowledge makes you wise. The more you know, the more you do. The more you do, the more you become. I'm telling you, nobody can ever say that education does not make people better. It makes you better than before. It might not make you righteous. But for some Christians, once the end product is not righteousness, it is useless for them. But please, the one who designed the aircraft you have been sitting in, was not a Christian. It might even be some occultist. Who designed the aircraft but you still appreciate it when you sit in an aircraft and it's flying you appreciate the fact that this heavy thing with all these loads inside can still hang in the air when you alone you cannot can still hang in the air and fly you must always appreciate people's mental capacity to do things they may not be christians but listen knowledge about god and knowledge about other things will make you better okay so cognitive wisdom can i show you something next slide now, Hosea 4 verse 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou has rejected knowledge, I will also reject you. That, has, that shall be no peace to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. In this case, God was speaking in the context of his laws. But God was also very specific. He said, because thou has rejected knowledge, I have also rejected you. Lack of knowledge is the cause of many people in poverty but the reason why parents who know put do you know that if you go to school your chances of succeeding in life is better than the person who hasn't gone to school at all i know people who say oh oh this man didn't go to school but he's prosperous please if you take thousand people who are successful count and see you will realize that out of the thousand people the 900 successful people amongst them are successful because of information because of school. The other hundred may, may, may be because of their soft skills, which they don't need to go to school to learn. But even if they are going to school to learn, they'll be better. I was listening to someone, was it, what is, so someone, I forgot who was in that, was saying that people say, um, Mark Zook, Mark Zook, um, no, um, Bill Gates, let, it's a drop, school dropout. But yet Bill Gates, the same Harvard he went to, that he dropped out, is giving Harvard money to train young people for him. Because he's seeing the value of education. It is not everything you see in Microsoft that was created by Bill Gates. There are top engineers who have studied, who have created those things. So information, so choose who you listen to. Choose what you read. And that's why every Wednesday you must be here. And I'm very intentional about the th these things I teach on the Wednesday teaching service. I'm very intentional about it. Because there are some of you, eh, you will not hear these words of wisdom on any platform. There are people, the last time they left school is 20 years ago. The only place they get information to make decisions is from the puppet.
Are, are you here with me? So choose who you listen to. Every Wednesday, come and listen to me. Choose what you read. Buy my books and read. And read the Bible. And choose what you watch. Please. Choose what you watch. Because they, they give you information. And that information determines the decisions you make. So let me show you something. So what is information? What is information? Information is knowledge gained from study, experience, or instruction. So three ways to get knowledge that can change your life. Three ways to get knowledge that can change your life. Number one, through study, the devotion of time and attention to acquiring knowledge. As I speak to you now, I'm doing two programs at the same time, doing a PhD and a second master's at the same time. Next week, next two weeks, I'll sit down for six hours every day listening to lectures from top faculty of London School of Economics. Online. When you come to my office next week and next two weeks, you won't see me. I'm locked up in my office, listening, jotting down notes. At the age of 50 something, I can still make time to learn. At the age of 20 something, you can't even read one book in a month. You can't even read one book in a month. At the age of 20 something, your interest is taught in reading. You won't get anywhere. You amount to anything. You must devote that. You see, the world system is built in a way that you need a certain kind of studies. No matter what you know, no matter what you know, you have to legitimize it with a certificate. Without you in the job, a man's value is measured by the information in his head. Without an information in your head, you are not valued. If you have a diploma, you are paid according to diploma value. That's the information in your head. If you have first degree, you are paid by that. Are you here? Good. Like, number one is experience. Knowledge gained as a result of an event. Knowledge gained as a result of an event. So a lot of things happen to us that God allows them to happen to us. And the main reason why God allows those things to happen to us is why we can learn from them. We can learn from them. There have been nothing negative or positive that I've gone through that I haven't picked very good lessons to apply in my life. Listen, don't be bitter in life by any experience. Get better with it. Bitterness has never brought development to anybody. It rather brought diseases and sicknesses to people. Don't be bitter. Be better. And the only way to get better is to learn from an experience. Are you here? The instructions, information shared through direction or order given by someone in authority. I've told you several times, our bishop will call me, to don't do it this way, do it that way. My spiritual father is there, sometimes I go to him, oh, Titi, don't do it this way, go here, do that, do this, do this. Sometimes there's something that you have programmed your mind over a period, long period of time, you want to do it. You meet someone who is more experienced, who has authority over you, and the person gives you the opposite advice. What do you do? Okay, the next one, I want to make sure that today, he was only at eight. So I, have, I, have, I have eight minutes. The next one is invention, and that is creative wisdom. Invention, creative wisdom. If we're sat me since the beginning of this series, I've spoken a lot about invention, creative wisdom. Your ability to create something very original is key to your success in life. And that's what wise people do. Can we go on? Look at this one. Proverbs 3, 19. By wisdom, the Lord laid the earth's foundation. By understanding, he set the heavens in place. So you see all the things you see about God's creation that you appreciate. The Lord did it by wisdom. The Lord did it by wisdom. Wisdom gives you the ability to invent things and to create things and to make things happen. It's called wisdom. When you see anybody has successfully created a business, it is, it is creative wisdom in operation. Somebody has successfully started something you haven't seen before. It's creative wisdom in, in operation. Sometimes the devil can take people's creative wisdom and use it for himself. 
That's why we have people who, are, who have set up disco and all those things. They are creating wisdom, but the devil is using it. Are you here? Then finally, finally, no, go, go. Finally, the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord, that is divine wisdom. Now, the fear of the Lord, divine wisdom. Now, now, with all the, the first six types of wisdom are shared, any unbeliever can have it and use it. But the difference between the believer and the unbeliever is that the believer must have this wisdom first, the fear of the Lord, divine wisdom. And this wisdom will throw better light on the other types of wisdom. So what is the fear of the Lord? Okay, let's go. Now, Proverbs 9 verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Proverbs 15 verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord teaches a man wisdom. And humility comes before honor. So now let me take you through. Let me try to define to you what the fear of the Lord is. So what is the fear of the Lord? What is the fear of the Lord? Next slide, please. Now, come. Here, here it is. Psalm 34, verses 11, 12, 13, and 14. Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. So, so now, the writer says, come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. So now he's going to teach us the fear of the Lord. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days? One, Keep your tongue from evil. The first thing about the fear of the Lord is that anybody who has the fear of the Lord keeps his tongue from evil. Two, and your lips from speaking lies. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. This is the definition of the fear of the Lord. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking lies. Anybody who has the fear of the Lord, one of the things you know, you notice in that person is that the person is very truthful. The person is not a liar, it's not a gossiper. The person is very truthful and honest. Then goes on to say that turn from evil. When the person who has the fear of the Lord, when the person sees evil, he turns away. But there are some people in, who are even born again who run towards where evil is. And do good. Seek peace and pursue it. People who have the fear of the Lord do not get into unnecessary conflicts. They seek peace and they pursue it. So what are the benefits of the, of, of the fear of the Lord? What are the benefits of the fear of the Lord? The 13 blessings of the fear of the Lord. The 13 blessings of the fear of the Lord. Now, Psalm 25 verse 12 to 14. Hear this. Who then is the man that fears the Lord? Here. Who then is the man that fears the Lord? He will instruct him in the way chosen for him. He will spend his days in prosperity and his descendants will inherit the land. The Lord confines in those who fear him and he makes his covenant known to them. Four things from this scripture. Four things. Those who fear the Lord will spend their days in prosperity. They will spend their days in prosperity. One of the blessings of the fear of the Lord is that you spend your days in prosperity. If you want to see prosperity in your life, fear the Lord. Number two, their children and their descendants will inherit the land. So, so even your children, the, the, day, the days of prosperity are extended on your children. They inherit things. They, they become mighty upon the earth. The Lord will confine in them. Can you imagine that if God wants to do something, he will come to you and confine in you. God will come and speak into your ears. I want, to, I want to bless somebody. Should I go ahead or not? So, in other words, God communicates with people who fear him. He shares his secrets with those who fear him. Then he makes his covenant known to them. Wow. Wow. Deep revelations. Next slide, please. Now, hear, hear this. Psalm 33, verse 18. But the, laws, the, but the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him. On those whose hope is in his unfailing love. Those who fear him, the eyes of the Lord are upon them. No evil eye can look upon me because I fear the Lord. I fear the Lord. No evil eyes can look upon me because I fear the Lord. The eyes of the Lord is upon me. The eyes of the Lord is upon me. 
When you fear the Lord, the eyes of God will be upon you. And if the eyes of God is upon you, who can be, do evil to you? Nobody. That's why it is your interest to fear the Lord. Shun evil. Pursue good. Do good. Pursue peace. Psalm 34 verse 7. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. And he delivers them. So the angel of the Lord encamps around those who do. So if you have a man who fears the Lord, the angels of the Lord will always encamp around them. So this man who was going to preach in a crusade was doing a crusade. But the third day, a witch in the community came to confess that the witches in the community decided that the crusade would not come on. And that they were going to get his car to get, his car to get accident on the first day when driving to the crusade grounds. They tried it. When the man was driving, they, they went to hide somewhere to ambush him in the realms of the spirit. When the car got to where the witches had come to cause the accident, they saw that the man's car was carried by angels. The man's car was carried by angels, so they couldn't attack the man. And the witch came to testify of that. So the angels of the Lord encamp around the men that fear the Lord. I said this, I think last Sunday or something, that when I see people, Christians who are too afraid, there's an indication that they themselves know that they have opened up themselves to something. Can we move on? Number seven, the seventh blessing. Psalm 34, verse 9. Fear the Lord, you, you he says. For those who fear him lack nothing. For those who fear him lack nothing. For those who fear him lack nothing. You understand? If you fear the Lord, you lack nothing. If you don't want to see lack in your house, fear the Lord. Number eight. Number eight. Psalm 112, verse 1 to, to 3. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who finds great delight in his commands. The, and then verse 2. His children will be mighty in the land. And the generation of the upright will be blessed. What will children become? They will be mighty in the land. Nine. Wealth and riches are in his house. And his righteousness endures forever. Wealth and riches will be in your house. Fear the Lord. And all these blessings will follow you. How many of you want these blessings? How many of you want it? All you have to do is do what? Fear the Lord. And these blessings will follow. Number ten. The ten blessings. Of those who fear the Lord. Blessed are all who fear the Lord. Who walk in his ways. You will eat the fruit of your labor. So, <laughs> number 10. You will eat the fruit of your labor if you fear the Lord. You will fear the Lord. You will eat the fruit of your labor. These are not the things I wrote myself of. It's in the Bible. The 11th blessing. They will enjoy household fruitfulness. Look at this. Verse 3 it says, Your wife would be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your sons would be like holy shoes around your table. That is the man blessed who fears the Lord. So your whole house will be fruitful. Whilst, whilst you yourself, your company is fruitful, your children's lives are fruitful, whatever your children will do, they succeed. Let me conclude on this one. 12. This is the last slide. Those who fear the Lord. This is the last slide. Now listen. The fear of the Lord brings long life. Psalm 10 verse 27. The fear of the Lord has length to life. But the years of the wicked are cut short. The fear of the Lord has length to life. Wow. Wow. So if you want to, you want to, you want to live long, fear the Lord. I said, mommy and I met an old lady. I think it was, it, she was in the hundreds, eh? Old lady at the naming ceremony engaged her in the chat was talking about how she has served the Lord all her life. And at the age of 100 and something, she looked so strong, you won't believe that this woman that is called the fear of the Lord has lent to your life. Then finally, you will enjoy divine protection if you fear the Lord. Proverbs 14, verse 26 to 27. He who fears the Lord has a secure fortress and for his children it will be a refuge. The fear of the Lord is the fountain of life, turning a man from the snares of death. Divine protection. You enjoy divine protection. When they lay a snare, a snare for premature death, the, the fear of the Lord, because you fear the Lord, the Lord will protect you. May the fear of the Lord come upon you. I say from today, may you fear the Lord. 
From today, may you fear the Lord and serve the Lord in Jesus' name. Rise on your feet, begin to pray.